All right, friends, uh, welcome. And uh, as always, we'll have more people joining us uh, by video later on. So welcome to you folks that are watching uh, that way. And uh, we're here tonight so you can uh, meet Reverend Nathan Arlich. And I know you're wondering which one in the room he is. It's this one right here. This is Nathan. And uh, Nathan, welcome. We're just uh, so glad that you're here and uh, that you're going to have an exciting ministry with us. And I just, well, I just wanted to say that how many of you were in church this morning? And so uh, this was amazing. We never know how somebody's going to do up front at the beginning. You know, usually new people are like, <clears throat> they look nervous and all. I look nervous. I've been doing it for years. And Nathan, you just looked calm. You had a great voice. You had charisma. You had presence. Like you looked really comfortable up there. Thank Were you comfortable up there? I was comfortable. It was a, um, I just guess telling of how it was all through the week leading up to worship. You know, just the hospitality here has made me feel welcome. Um, doors have been open literally and figuratively to lots of great conversations, um, lots of great people, um, over coffee, over lunches, over dinners to be. So stepping into worship and seeing some of those few familiar faces that I know um, really made it nice. Yeah, and you're preaching next week. I am. I saw it. I thought, man, he's going to be good. Are you a good preacher? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most honest answer. Like, we try. It's hard. <laughs> Sometimes it's a sacrifice bunt. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so we want to get to know you. I'm going to ask you. We have not rehearsed this in the least. He has no idea what I'm going to ask him tonight, Nothing. which is great fun. Do you know what I'm going to ask you tonight? Not at no. all. <laughs> all right. So, so probably most importantly, uh, I guess the story begins with somebody who's in the room. So Faye, raise your hand, Faye. This is Mama. <laughs> The, the, you, you should applaud for her. I mean, yeah. And she's sitting with Isaac, who is uh, Nathan's brother. And uh, we're really glad that y'all are here with us. Anything you want to say about Nathan? Any embarrassing stories you'd like to tell? Or? Okay, all right. Tell us afterwards, and that'll be good. Uh, so, Nathan, tell us just a little bit, you know, where, where you were born, where you grew up, uh, sure. some of that. Yeah. Yeah. So originally from Hendersonville, um, just over in the mountains a little ways. Um, grew up Methodist, born and raised, and through First United Methodist Church there. Had some fantastic preachers and associates come through. Um, all um, were able to, you know, illumine the scriptures in different ways in their own rights. One of those um, who is a dear friend today and a dear friend of James is Donna Claycomb. Um, Donna Claycomb Skull now, um, who's a pastor at Mount Vernon Place in Washington, D.C. So she was um, just really instrumental of what I would see in a pastor that I would want to be one day and follow. And as I look back on that hindsight, it's, it's nice to see, you know, she's doing some really incredible ministry. And hopefully I can follow in those big shoes that she um, places in this world. So. Oh, yeah. Don, Don, Don is amazing. The way this happens is always interesting. So people, like we have an application process and all that. That's never the way it actually happens. So the way this happened is that literally we put out word we were going to hire a minister of missions. This is right after Michelle announced that she was going to Africa. The first electronic reply I got was from Donna. And she said, the, the guy you're going to want is named Nathan Arlich. And I kind of fouled that away. <laughs> and here he is. Same thing happened with Jimmy Jones, by the way. You know, the first name said to me was, you will hire Jimmy Jones. I'd never heard of him. And we did. So, uh, so Donna's cool. So yeah, you can absolutely. emulate her in absolutely. some way. That's good. Now, the, I, I, something again about the preaching and worship thing. So you're a good preaching and worship leader, but, but you're here to do mission. I mean, how do you see the connection between what we do in a worship service and our mission, like, outside the walls? Sure. So... Um, I've always held the two in close relationship because everything that we're called to do is to worship God. Every single moment of our lives, every breath that we take, every fresh new inhale is giving us another opportunity to give just honor and praise to God. So whenever we get to go outside the walls or beyond the walls, and I hope you'll start paying attention to some writings because I'm going to title th some things beyond the walls. Um, that's when we truly worship in a lot of respect. That's when people who don't come inside our walls will really get to experience the love and the grace and the peace and the mercy of God. And to see what Jesus is really calling us to is the sacrificial love. 
the sacrificial of giving up our time or giving up our comfort zones or taking us from where it feels nice and cozy to where it smells, where it's dirty, where it's nitty and it's gritty, and you don't want to be there anymore, but that person that you're talking to, that you're developing a relationship with, needs you just for that extra second, needs you for that extra moment that you can just take time and say, me second, neighbor first. And that's all through the Holy Spirit that takes us. One thing that I love to remind people of, and it'll probably be in the sermon next week, too, is don't, the, don't give it away. <laughs> little teaser here. Um, is that the same Holy Spirit that came down upon Jesus in the form of the dove is the same exact Holy Spirit that's in us. And you talk about an incredible, wonderful spirit to lead us, that we can do things as Jesus did. And before Jesus ascended, what did he say? You're going to do far and greater things than I. Now that's cool. Now, that's something that, yeah, that's a heavy weight that we carry, but we're not alone in that. The burden's not all on us. We're yoked together with Christ. And so when we go and serve, when we go into the streets, preaching manifests itself in so many ways. And truly, when you're sitting down with somebody who's coming off of a binge drinking night and sleeping on a bench somewhere, and you can sit down and offer them a sandwich or offer them a hot meal, you've worshiped God. Well, you know, the, I, was, I, was, I was thinking to ask you to tell these folks how you were drawn into ministry, how you were drawn to be a minister. I, don't, I think I want to ask that differently because the way you were talking about just then, I mean, it sounds like you're somebody who you have personally been really moved by Jesus. Hmm. So much so that you really want to give your life to this thing. And that's... That means you have the job as a minister, but it's beyond that, right? Sure. It's really who you are. Like, how, how did that come to be? Like, how did that fire strike in you? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, as you were speaking about in your sermon this morning, it, it's this continual daily living, this continual giving yourself to God and seeking God's will and seeking God's um, place in your life. And one of the key words there is surrender is that continual surrender. Surrender to what God wants. Surrender to what Christ's teachings were. Surrender to what the Spirit is leading to do. And so for my own life, I I try to do that the best I can, is that daily surrender. Um, And it would start um, back there with Mom again, I suppose, um, for her patience. And also, um, if you read the article about me before I came, is talking about a, a trip that we took as a family down to Charleston, South Carolina, and it wasn't for vacation. It was after Hurricane Hugo, and my parents loaded us up, and we went down, and we picked up sticks. I probably fell asleep on the truck seat once in a while, but I got back out, and Dad was cutting up trees off people's houses. And so just, just formational times throughout my life like that that I look back upon has really put me where I am now. Now, one of the funniest stories in our family, I think it is, it's my grandmother. She was a um, devout member of Central United Methodist in Shelby. And she was in charge of offering um, the discretionary fund. So they let um, lay people do it. And so she was there on one Thursday. And she was, she was giving and giving and giving. And one, this guy came in and took her purse. Well, grandmother at the time was like 83 years old, and she just took out running after him. <laughs> and, and after she got back and she got done with that, she's like, you know, it, it, I didn't care if he had the contents. I just, I just wanted my pictures back. I just wanted my personal items back. And just speaking to just want to give. And that's just what it was ingrained in our family. That's, that's what we do. You, you give. You help others. You serve others. You put yourself second. Um, more moments like that. My parents were instrumental in starting this um, dinner at First Hendersonville called the Harvest Dinner. And they got community-wide <laughs> leaders together. They got the chicken donated. They got all this um, donated. They bust people coming in. We would go out into the parks and pass out flyers. And we would feed hundreds of people who were hungry. And just gave a place to worship, gave a place to sit around a common table. Again, that worship question, true life worship, no matter what walk of life you came from, 
the table was open. So it's worth noting that your grandmother and your parents, all these people you're describing, are not ordained people. Right. Right? Right. So what's the relationship of the ordained people to actually ministry that happens in the church? Like sometimes we worry that people think, like, you're the spectators and you watch us be ministers. But, I mean, how does that work? Like, you're a minister of missions, but, like, who does it? It's, it's not... Hopefully people don't watch you and say, no, oh, Nathan, no, no, it's no. amazing. That's, that's all you guys. Um, so the, the few that I've spoken so far who are going to Haiti, um, those people who are involved with the um, other ministries and the community, it's something that we, we can't sit back here and you know operate and run a church and operate and run a missions office and operate and do all these things. We can encourage and we empower but the true life, the true hands and the feet, the true voice of God comes from each and every one of you. And when it comes to ministry, and especially in the area of missions, you know, so, so often I would hear, well, I can't go on a mission experience. I can't go and take this time away. I can't go and do this. And I said, that's okay. You still can be in mission. And then they would, you know, bristle back a little bit. And I said, all you have to do is pray. You can pray daily for the team members. You can take each and everyone's name and pray 10 minutes before your day starts. You know, you have a team of 12. That's only two hours of prayer through a day. You know, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. You know, if that seems like a lot, okay, will it down to five minutes and have an hour's worth of prayer? You know, John Wesley, he prayed a, he prayed uh, a good bit. Yeah. You know? So it, it takes that community. It takes everyone coming together and recognizing that you have a spot on the team, that you have a spot in the life of your church. You have a spot to give back to God. So tell us about uh, college and seminary. Yeah. So I'm a graduate of Western Carolina. Um, I went there with the intention of becoming an elementary ed school teacher. Um, then with big hopes to go to um, Georgia, they had a fantastic master's of administration program. And so I thought, you know, that'd be good, you know, get in there, be a principal and all this good stuff. Um, so, you know, Western was Western. It was a good time. It was um, formational in my life. I was able to lead three trips down to New Orleans for Katrina relief um, through some just different student organizations. Um, and so did that. That was a lot of fun. Um, graduated 06 in December after God had different plans, and I said yes to God's plans uh, to enter into the ministry. Um, I took an extra lap around, or extra half lap around, um, so I could fulfill some requirements. I graduated with a um, major in history and a minor in psych, um, so both of which I still thoroughly love um, and see so much correlation with ministry, especially in the field of psychology and the holistic care of self and the, just how your brain works and operates. By the way, go see Inside Out. Um, fantastic movie. Um, it's, not, it's just so good. Oh, it's great. Um, so I graduated in 06, December 06, and I went um, to Durham to be a youth minister at a church called Aldersgate United Methodist. And while I was there, a very persistent senior pastor said, you're going to apply for um, Duke. Now, I, I wanted to take a little bit of time off before going back to grad school, and I had toured Candler, and I had toured Duke, um, and I called SMU to see if they would fly me, but they didn't. Um, so I didn't go down there. And I was all set on going to Candler. Um, one thing you're going to learn about This is me, at Emory University. Yeah. And I'm a, far inferior yeah. to Emory School. Yeah. I'm a huge Atlanta Braves fan. So I thought to myself, oh, I go to Candler, I can get student tickets, I'll be right down the road, I can, it'll be just fantastic, it'll be a dream come true. Um, well, I didn't quite enjoy my tour while I was there, so um, that one put aside. I go and take a tour of Duke and fell in love with it. And everybody who's a Duke fan understands why. Um, it's a beautiful campus, not only because of the wonderful basketball team, but the, the campus itself, especially the Divinity School, really prides itself, I would say, on developing community and just a place of holiness. Um, and I really experienced that and really experienced um, strong community. I have 
three um, wonderful friends, all pastors, um, one in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, one in Christiansburg, Virginia, and one in Naperville, Illinois. Um, and we're just super close. We do things together. We travel together um, and enjoy it. And so that's what Duke did beyond just a fantastic education, um, but to really have a support group. Uh, for the first two years in ministry, we would all Skype together just to check in every Sunday, like, how did it go? How was your Sunday? What was awful? <laughs> what was something you could celebrate? How are you going to improve in the next week? So it's just this really neat uh, ability to continue to have this relationship continue to form. What's like the, uh, you said what went wrong, like, what's like the, dumbest, most embarrassing thing you've done as a minister? <laughs> um, this would take me a while to answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many. Dumbest? I guess a couple. Um, one of them is really silly. Uh, we were doing the Apostles' Creed, and I started out with the Lord's Prayer. It's close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> And so um, that was a silly moment. And then a, a real learning moment um, that was, you know, you know, I'm not afraid to fail. I'll go ahead and disclaim that right now. You have to. You sharpen yourself that way. And if you take chances, you take risk. it's okay to fail um, as long as you learn from those mistakes. And one of those learning mistakes was I was um, charged at Front Street with working with young adults. And Front young Street's adults. the church in Burlington where we worked before yeah. we came here. Yeah. And so I was charged with working with the young adults and the young families and trying to get them more involved in the church. And so, you know, I'm, I'm single. I don't have any kids. I've been around kids. Um, I like kids. My brother has wonderful kids. And I would just make the general assumption, if I schedule something, you can be there. I mean, and so what I learned from that is families with kids can't just all of a sudden drop everything that they're doing <laughs> to be at an awesome Bible study that I'm going to lead, you know? And so what I learned is it takes lots of listening, lots of talking. Um, and that was what my first year at Front Street, and that helped significantly. Um, in fact, it was one of the answers for my um, ordination papers that I used to highlight a, a point of growth in my ministry. So. What, uh, what, got, what interested you about Myers Park? Like, you know, I contacted you, Donna spoke to you. Mm -hmm. you know, what made you say, oh, I'm going to talk to those people? And you, know, you came here and we interviewed and met and sure. you God was calling you. I mean, what, what drew you here? So uh, you'll learn this quickly. I have a huge passion for missions. Um, and when I say that this is, this is my ideal job and position and ministry and calling, and there's no embellishment on that at all. It's just truly who I am. 2012, I was traveling to some country. Um, it might have been Costa Rica. We went to um, Costa Rica with Will Bailey as well um, with my college team. And when I'm flying and traveling, I, I take time to write, and just it's a great thing to do just to get your thoughts out, get things going. And on this particular occasion, I wrote down what would be my ideal next placement. And it described the job description to a T that Myers Park put out. And so what drew me was the opportunity that this was actually a real life thing that this position actually existed in a They're church. They're money to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to know that it's in an urban setting where I feel this r real strong passion. I love um, international, and now another love that I have is urban uh, ministry. And again, to walk on the sidewalks. To I was downtown the other night, um, and I was amazed of how many... Um, people were sitting on the benches and how many people would just walk by. And I was guilty of that. I just walked by. I was with a couple of friends. I was just going to the, where I was going to go to. But just to know that the opportunity is here to go and tap into that well of um, relationships and sisters and brothers who just need somebody to go sit down on a bench with them, go and share a meal. And you've been meeting people this first week. You've been out, you've been busy. You've been to, where have you been? You've been to the men's shelter already? I've and been to the men's shelter. What's, what's a highlight of what you've seen your first few days here? 
just the hands that are out there. You know, we can give money all day long. Giving money doesn't give you somebody's name, though. Giving money is something that's nice. But to see, like when I was at the men's shelter, there's a photo of a team from Myers Park serving um, dinner there one night. And just to know that that's there. Know that there's people already doing that. Know that there's people already within your community that can share a story and can get you hooked into it. Because once you get hooked into serving, once you get hooked into missions, it's addicting. And I'm going to go ahead and let you know that right now. It's, and it's a wonderful thing because you want to just you want to do more and more and more. And you want to see people's lives transform because your, your life is going to transform. You're going to want to know more people's names because when you know someone's name, it's no longer a stranger. It's now a sister or brother. It's now a relationship. Um, and so seeing the men's shelter, knowing what an incredible place that is, Carson, the executive director there, is doing a fantastic job of seeking um, for these men to have permanent housing, to get them jobs, and to get just life back on their feet. But also somewhere that we can be hands for that, as he was telling me, you know, we're so thankful for the blessing of financial gifts, but we need tutors during the day. We need people that can come and help read a resume and help get people into and and fill out applications for apartments or for rental homes. Um, So there's an opportunity. It's four miles from the church. It's not far. I'll be more than willing to put you in my truck and we'll drive down there and we'll sit for a couple hours as we help these men and we learn somebody's name. The, uh, so you said this is a, like a dream job sure. for you. Let's say, let's say you've been here five years. Let's go forward to 2020. And it's been like a dream experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like, what does it look like? like? What's your dream for our mission program here? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so, I just thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, non-rehearsed. Um, the dream would be to see the involvement from, from what it is now, which is great, to even beyond. Um, so say you have 10 people involved in the men's shelter. Well, let's take that up to 50 people. Well, if you have 20 people in, involved with crisis center, well, let's take that up to 100. You know, just to see the growth of lay involvement. But also then to really understand why we are doing it. To take it to the depth of a theological understanding of why is God calling us to serve? Why does God place it upon our hearts that when we see the least, the lost, and the broken, that they are not just to stay there, that the world is not supposed to have all of these divisions, but that we are really truly called to be around a common table. Um, Something you're going to learn is I love sacraments. So with communion, think of that rich image of the heavenly banquet. Well, the kingdom of God is right here, right now. And that heavenly banquet can be seen right here and right now. Where it's not just a wonderful room of all white. But it's everybody. It's everybody is coming around, breaking bread, enjoying the cup, enjoying the loaf, and knowing that we all have a spot. We all have a chair to pull up to the table. And that we have chairs to offer people, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have plenty of chairs out in our houses, right? When's the last time we've invited people in? So in 2020, what does it look like to have homes opened up for people to come and join you? For people who you would never have thought of to join you at your kitchen table, at your dining room table, in your living room. Maybe it's grilling out. Anybody else a football fan here? Maybe, maybe it's Saturdays in the fall where you're inviting a complete stranger over to grill out hot dogs or grill out hamburgers or steaks, pull out the finest wines as Jesus did at the wedding, and say, come on, let's have a good time. That's kind of one of those things Jesus told us to do, right? When you have a dinner party, who do you invite? Yeah. Right. Um, you reminded me of a dream I had that I kind of had forgotten about the other day. We were talking about Jubilee Plus. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell them what you asked me, the, the dream you had about that. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to raise a million dollars. Yeah, so the Straight history up. of Jubilee Plus, let's see, Ken Garfield, you're, what, what year did we start Jubilee Plus? Has that been nine years ago now, eight? Yeah, so we started the Special Mission Fund, and it's been really cool. And I think the first year we had about $350,000. It was tracking up, and we got to about $650,000 annually. And then we had the bank wipe out, and this thing dropped down to just under $300,000. And it's creeping back up. Nathan reminded me, though, that the year we had six fifty, my dream was to say, Let's, why can't we get to a million? And uh, what you'll learn as you get to know this community is the money's there. Mm -hmm. The money's there. It's just getting folks to be generous and to say, we want to do that. I think how cool that goal would be, right, is that we're pumping a million dollars, and it's 100% to mission through Jubilee Plus. So uh, thank you for reminding me of something that's uh, very important uh, for us. Um, let me ask you guys, as you've come, what would you want to ask Nathan? So international is um, very, very important. Um, and in fact, um, I encourage, and it might seem a little bit backwards, but if people are really hesitant to step into the mission field or to, to be a part of missions ministry, I say, come with me to an international experience. And it, it does a couple of things. It really gives you a worldly view so that you're no longer just living in a local view with local blinders and you're going about your day, but it gives you an understanding of the global impact that we actually can have. Um, and so, one, I mean, you get to go out and you get to meet some incredible people in an international realm and you come back transformed. So when you come back transformed, you want to see transformation happen in your own backyard, or at least that's the prayer of going on an international mission experience. Um, and with the international peace, I mean, you not only get to experience the other culture, which will help you tremendously, especially in a city the size of Charlotte. There's so much, many other people here besides us. There's so much culture that is all around us just being ready to tap into. But when you're on a, a mission for seven days or 10 days or two weeks um, with 12 to 20 of your fellow lay people, the relationships that you form, the bonds that will come out of that is transformational for the body here at Myers Park. And I had countless times, of, and I love um, intergenerational ministry so much that I would have um, from 19 years old on a Haiti mission experience and to seven, he turned 71 when we were in Haiti one time. And to know that they saw each other every single Sunday morning but didn't know their names, each other's names. And to now know that they had a relationship and that they would go out and do and do service in their own community. So that's, that's very, very important and dear to me. Yeah. Who else? Rita. Going in October um, to Haiti, yeah. Have you been here before? Yes, ma'am. This will be my fourth time. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful country. It is. And it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are cool. those signs at the uh, Bayonne or different parts of Haiti that you did? They were in the community called Titian. Um, so here's Haiti. <laughs> And uh, so Port-au-Prince is here. Uh, Titian is about right here, about 35 miles outside the city, whereas you know Bayonnais is um, a little further up. Yes, sir. You've mentioned basketball and baseball and football. Yeah. You look very fit. Do you have an athletic background? <laughs> um, I, a little bit, I guess. Um, so I grew up playing sports, um, soccer, basketball, and baseball. Um, definitely baseball is my um, favorite. Um, I love playing soccer, though, if I get an opportunity. So I just can't mess up my knee. Coach Sir? Have you spent any time with Coach Cheshire? 
Um, as close as I can get to <laughs> um, but never a, a one-on-one. So many, many days and nights and, um, and uh, Cameron, I went blank, that was sad. He's a, he's, a, he's a compelling guy. I used to take note of his basketball camp every summer. And uh, he would come out, and he, he, did, he never did, here's how you pass a basketball. Here's how you block out to get it. He never did any of that. He would just do these uh, things like, uh, do we care about each other? Do you care about me? I mean, he would talk about in, interpersonal things, and it was really profound and compelling. He's a fascinating guy. Who else? I don't know, unless you want to keep talking about Duke basketball. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> carry on for a long night. <laughs> yeah. John's squirming. Wonderful question. Um, prayer, lots of prayer, um, lots of surrender to what God's will is for the advancement of the missions. That's something I pray about daily and uh, many times a day is, all right, God, where's next? What's the next step? So I encourage everyone here to be in prayer for that and to share that word um, with your friends and your circles, your Sunday school group, your bridge clubs, wherever you find yourself. Share it. Talk about it. That's, that's the number one way that we're going to see the, uh, the hive come alive, if you will, um, is to get the buzz going to talk about, hey, this is what's going on. We need to share it. We need to get people out. Um, they need to go see the crisis. They need to go see men's shelter. They need to go see, um, what's the, the, the trafficking, the human trafficking house? Lily pad. Hey, lily pad. pad. They need to go see lily pad. And that's something that's dear to me. Um, make sure that we are aware of the trafficking issues in Charlotte. Um, and we don't get just stuck on, oh, it's the sex trafficking. No, it's, it's human trafficking. It's slavery. And just so any opportunity you have, be a voice. Um, we're, we're gifted these voices for a reason, and that's to speak up. Um, and so just find yourself doing that in the community. You, you can ask me that question all later. I'm kidding. It's all right. <laughs> Who else? Yes, John. James asked you what your vision would be five years from now. Uh-huh. Sure. Just abject poverty. If you could look five years forward, even though it may need to be twenty, what what is your your prayer or your wish for what we can do that would be lasting for the people of Haiti? Yeah, that really changes. Yeah, um, I, Haiti is a is a beautiful country, and what I've seen succeed there that I hope that we can continue to do um, is the education. Um, of the young girls and the young uh, boys and really the, actually a, a lot of the young women and getting that education going and having their voice heard and just to really, anytime we're there, to empower because it is still a, a sexist nation in a lot of realms. And just to say, you know what, you have a voice, you have a presence, speak up. Um, and so anything that can be turned into a sustainable um, economy, sustainable garden, sustainable um, school system, that's what my, my prayer is, that when we go down there, um, that we, you know, we can build cement walls. And you can think about that as an image, too. You know, we can go down there and build classrooms and everything like that. That's great. But what, well, what would it look like if a bunch of Haitians could build that and then we could you know, teach classes, we could um, share in God's word in the community, and just finding ourselves pouring into individuals that they then can go into their neighborhoods and pour in and be a champion of that neighborhood, if you will. Sometimes some thing when you, when you have a new person, it kind of makes you rethink some things that you've been living with for a while. So what, like when I think about mission things, Sometimes there are situations, and Haiti's one of them, where you just think, this is never going to get any better. But, but then, I mean, God can do amazing things, and history can turn on a dime, and things can happen. When I was a kid, if you, if, when I was growing up, the Soviet Union was just evil, impenetrable. The idea that you would ever go there, that you would be a friend of someone there, but that's changed in ways that we could never have anticipated. 
Haiti's got natural resources. They've been a mess for a long time. I continue to be optimistic. As I've said, we've had some kids who've been through the school system now long enough, and we've sent them off to college, and they're coming back. And if you just keep duplicating that over and over, I, I think it's going to matter there. But then I'm reminded that maybe Haiti never gets better. I, I just want to say it's okay. Not that it's a good thing that it doesn't get better, but I had dinner with Kevin Wright, who formerly sat in your, uh, he's a wonderful guy, he's in New York now. And we were talking about it, and uh, it was just, it was amazing to me. He was thanking me for his time here and all that it had meant to him. And he said, I said, what, what stands out in your mind? And this was amazing to me. I don't know if you remember this story. I can't remember the name of the hurricane. There's a hurricane, they get hurricanes. I mean, if we had the hurricanes Haiti has, Charlotte would be a wasteland. You know, like we just take these things for granted. We have a hurricane once in 100 years. They have them like twice a year. It just destroys everything. But if you remember this hurricane, and it cut off the food supply, and the bridge is washed out, and they, were, they weren't getting food. And Kevin and I worked for days and days, finally requisitioned a helicopter and took food in there. And Kevin said, one thing I know is that because of my time at Myers Park and what we did, there's, there are people alive who wouldn't be alive. Hmm if we hadn't done that. He had tears in his eyes talking about it. That's no small thing. And the other thing about Haiti that it just moves me uh, is um, the first time I was there on a Sunday morning, I was preaching. And uh, first you hear these roosters that start, you know, before the sun comes up. But that wasn't really the first sound of the morning. The first sound of the morning was people were already gathering in the church building and they were singing. It's like 5.15 a.m., and I'm not an early riser. I was kind of annoyed. And they sang and sang until 10 when church began. And so everybody was there. And this is amazing, because here Americans are all big on, do I have to dress up for church? We want casual dress. It would be welcoming to everyone. So Haiti is like the poorest place on planet Earth, and Bayonne is the poorest place in Haiti, the poorest place on planet Earth. You go to church there, all the men wear a coat and tie, Boys wear old suits. The girls wear dress. They don't have anything. But for them, they're like, that. we do that to honor God. And they come to church, and they're very serious about it, and it doesn't end in an hour, and they're not checking their watch. And the worship is joyful and really exciting, and we, we're, we just get put in the shade by this. So we could say, well, they'll never be better. Well, but they may look at us and say, well, those Americans are never going to be better, right? <laughs> They're a mess there in America, and I don't know if that's ever going to get better, right? So, so it's a time to rethink some of that. Do you do some things because it will work, or do you just do it? I like the idea that we do it just to glorify God. You do things because you think God's called you to do it, and God's pleased that you do it. Anyway, I'm taking your time. What else do you want to ask Nathan? Tom. Um, James touched on Yeah, I would say the new connections that I form and connecting people. I love to do that. I love to see um, a couple of connections happen, such as I was um, teaching a youth group up at Genaluska on Thursday and Friday um, this past weekend. And just as simple as talking to the, some of the seniors who are going off to school, um, one of them made the decision to go to University of South Carolina. And it, it ha I happen to know that um, one of the um, former students at Front Street in Burlington was going there. And so I just put him in contact. I said, hey, look, you're both going to be freshmen. You guys have similar interests. You guys should connect. It's a big school. Um, you need that community to happen. So that's one thing. It's just to see, all right, am I making connections? And the other one that's really important to me is knowing people's names. That's, that's crucial for me, is just get to know somebody's name because then you have a relationship with them. 
Yeah, it might not be the strongest. You're not maybe having dinner every Friday night or having coffee every second Tuesday or something. But at least you know you have somebody's name and you can you know, see them somewhere and you can call them out because it's personal then. So I would, I would think those would be two important ones. I always plead, this is none of the people in this room, for the people that are watching out there on video. Um, it, I mean, two things. One is, I always have mercy on us clergy. Like, our job's harder than it looks. But the name thing is really interesting. Because, uh, so Nathan lands here, and we've got 5,000 people, right? And the names come at you just in a swarm. So you stand on the line, and 78 people file by, and you're trying to remember their name. So like, have mercy on him, have mercy on all of us, and just repeat your name. Be simple. That's Wear right. your name tag. It's just such a great thing when you do that. That's all. We want to know everybody's names, and it's just harder than mm -hmm. you'd think it is. Yep. Yeah. What else? I think you find a lot of love. Here. I've Absolutely. already felt it. I mean, the, the love is wonderful. People have stopped by, just want to say hi, want to say welcome, and it's been really enjoyable. Absolutely, Cliff. Thank you. What else? Do you have any friends here in Charlotte that you met at Duke or Western, or are you coming, you know, with some connections? Yes and no. Work, so yeah. Great. So Tiffany Thomas over at um, South Tryon Community, we went to Duke together, so I know her well. Um, so it would be nice to reconnect and have conversations, and plus that's a wonderful ministry um, that is supported through here, um, and a, a walk um, side by side with each other. So that's going to be nice to um, see come about. Um, and a, a few people from Western I know, not many in the area anymore. Um, but as for Duke, um, just Tiffany. So, yeah. Meeting new friends, which is always great. Where are you I'm living in South End. Um, yeah. yeah. So accessible, real close to a lot of things. He's, you can see Sedgefield Middle School from his apartment. It's yeah. right down in the... Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Yes. Yes. Will you be our liaison between our tables? Yes. He doesn't know that, but yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will be the lady. Thur Thursday, you're going to lunch at South <laughs> which is a great... Tell what Trinity's table is. Yeah. Tell, what, tell me what Trinity Stable is. I think we yeah, may have told about it. We have a community lunch mm -hmm. uh, every Thursday at South Ryan, and there are probably 10 to 15 people that come to lunch with us So Tiffany kind of turned it into church. It's a cool thing. If you haven't been to that, you ought to go by. There's a wonderful program. We know a lot of people by name. And they Good. Seem to really that. Absolutely. Good. Thank you for asking that. What else? I bet these guys would want to know how, how do you pray do a devotional life? How do you connect with God? Yeah. Just yourself. So in the mornings, one of my practices is to um, just read a couple scriptures. So um, I'll go through the Psalms, and then with the Psalms, I'll go through another book of the Bible. And so I'll read the Psalm first, and then I'll have a time of prayer in between that, and then I'll read um, whatever passage is next, or whatever chapter is next. Um, so right now, I'm in the Psalms, and I'm reading through Ephesians, one, because I'm preaching on it next week, but um, two, it's just a great book to be reminded of when you start new beginnings and new journeys. Um, and so just really being intentional about that, um, and then do prayers of the people um, coupled with that, and prayers for the church. Um, and then for a personal self-care, too, where I have a lot of conversations um, with God, um, is running or exercising and just finding that place where I can just um, zone out the world, just turn it off, and then just, you know, when I run, just think a lot and just pray and um, consider and vision. So. Cool. Good. 
What else, anyone? Anything else you want these guys to know about you? I love to I have fun. I forgot to ask you about yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, um, I love to have fun. I, I love to laugh. It's really important to me. Um, and so you'll, you'll hopefully pick up on that and see that. I love to joke, too. Um, so um, be aware of that, letting you guys know now. Um, and, and in that, I think we're gifted the gift of laughter. I think we're gifted the, the space to have enjoyment in life. Because if you <laughs> don't know, missions can be really heavy at times. You know, you see a lot of brokenness. You see a lot of hurt. You see a lot of just injustices and just sometimes really mean people um, in that. And so you have to find a place to laugh. You have to find people to surround yourself with. Um, and so just don't be afraid to have fun with me. Uh, it, it's, I, I enjoy it. It gives me life. Um, it gives us life. Um, other fun facts? I guess I'll do that real fast. I have a wonderful six-year-old English bulldog. Um, his name's Pendleton. Um, <laughs> he's very regal at times. Not really. Um, <laughs> he's a mess. Um, I'm a huge sports fan. So going back to that, let's highlight that. Go Duke. Go yeah, Braves. Yeah, that Hornets language earlier. Did you notice that? And the hive with the buzz. Yeah. yeah it's got that going. Yeah. yeah. Good. Just if we could get Curry over here. You know, get that. That would be nice. Uh, I'm sure he'll be watching this later. So, <laughs> Curry, come to Charlotte. He's um, a Davidson guy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Any any questions in regards to that type of stuff? Have you been to the Knights game yet? I have not, but I'm going on Friday night. Yes, ma'am. It's Friday night fireworks. So. Great ballpark. Yeah. Very cool. Um, not the triathlons, but I'll, I'll run. Um, so I, I get to like three miles right now, and I'm just like, eh, that's good. <laughs> and so I haven't pushed myself much more beyond that. Um, right? 92 and running. Oh, it was a great story. ESPN covered her and all that, so that's good stuff. Saw that before I came. Um, but I have done the turkey trot. Um, I did that a couple years ago, actually, um, down at South Park, so that was nice. Do you have 24 hours of duty coming out to each site? I do not. <laughs> Nor do I stay up 24 hours. It kind of comes right by the church. Yeah. We shot down out here. It shuts down, but it's part of the neighborhood. If you want a truly religious experience, you ought to go to a basketball game with a dean. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been to the Dean Dump? Oh, have you I been have. there? Yeah, we've, we've been there. We know what it There's is. There's lots of praying. It's nice that they have it very silent in there for prayer. Yeah, that's right. So. It's quiet. <laughs> Modest noise. That's right. <laughs> All right, David. Where's brother David? Is it No, Isaac. Isaac. He lives in Mint Hill. Okay. Yeah. So it's about 15 miles actually from where I live, so not too far. No. All right, friends, thank you for coming out uh, thank you tonight. We look forward to a great time together. Have a good evening.